the best thing to do is not to inject the wastewater. Now this is what's happening in Pennsylvania, not because of an earthquake problem, but because they simply don't have any geologic formations that are suitable for large scale uh, wastewater injection. Uh, Texas has 50,000 wastewater injection wells. Pennsylvania has nine. And the, the reason is that, well, of course, Texas has a big oil and gas industry, but Penn, Pennsylvania is developing one. But they, they basically don't have the geologic formations into which to inject this water. So they were hauling it by truck to Ohio to better geology to the west, which was, well, you know, they had no choice. Um, and that was a really stupid thing to do. Um, uh, but now what they do is they, they, they recycle the water. About 25% of the injected water comes back on average. They put it into lined ponds. There's a double lining of plastic. There's bird netting on there to keep animals out of it. They put the, um, the saline water into these ponds and then they pump it out uh, when they go to hydrofrac the next well. So they put it right back where it came from. And they use less water and they've gotten rid of this problem. We know how to solve it. So can hydraulic fracturing you know, enable this bridge to a green, a green future? I, I, think, you know, I think it certainly can. Hydraulic fracturing is the key enabling technology simply because the permeability of these rocks are so low you cannot produce the hydrocarbons without it. So when people say, well, shale gas is okay, just don't do hydraulic fracturing, they actually have it all backwards. The, it can't be done without hydraulic fracturing, and hydraulic fracturing itself is not the direct problem. And, uh, you know, we have a lot more work to do, but shale gas can be developed in an environmentally responsible manner. Um, George Schultz, who I've had the pleasure to come to know uh, in the last couple years at Stanford, um, you know, he's a man of great experience and great wisdom, and he has a way of just kind of taking a one-hour talk like this and reducing it to a few words, let's not blow it. It's an unprecedented global opportunity. And that really, I could have saved you all a lot of time by just <laughs> quoting, quoting George. So um, I do think it represents um, a bridge to a green future. But you know, we can't lose sight of the larger problem. You know, gas is not the answer. We have to, you know, we're still emitting, right? If we double the energy system and we emit half as much CO2 as we um, currently do by doubling it, basically our emissions are, are the same, aren't they? So um, we, 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 you know, we have to solve this problem on many fronts. And switching from coal to natural gas is something we can do and should do and need to do, especially in countries like China and India with rapidly growing economies, rapidly growing energy use, and rapidly growing CO2 emissions. But at the same time, we have to sustain efforts to develop you know, a decarbonized energy future, or if you want to think about the uh, uh, sort of the metaphor of a bridge, um, well, you know, there's got to be something on the other side of that bridge, right, when, when we get there. And natural gas can be a bridge, but we have to, you know, uh, you know keep, uh, you know, developing sustainable uh, energy sources, wind and solar, and it would be wonderful to see a nuclear renaissance because we have to move to a decarbonized energy future. It's just going to take decades to get there, and natural gas can help uh, pave the way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zobach. That was a fascinating talk. I'd like to present you with the official Cafe Sci mug. <laughs> there we go for oh, you. Great. Um, and we'll take your questions at the two microphones in the back. If you want to line up there, we'll start over here, and then we'll go back and forth. Oh, are we on? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm interested in what, what is the volume of rock that is actually fractured in, say, a mile long drilling? What, do you fracture out a radius of 50 feet or something? No, it's, 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 it's larger than that. Let, larger, me, okay. let me come back to one of these figures and I'll, uh, I'll put some uh, physical dimensions on it. That's a good question. I should have uh, addressed it along the way. So the well is fractured multiple times. They, they isolate 
between a one and 300 foot interval of the well. Mm -hmm. And then when the fractures propagate, they propagate perpendicular to the well, as shown here, uh, a couple of hundred feet. So that fracture length might be 500 feet. Oh, the shale is oh. maybe 100 feet thick, and right? So it's propagating out, it's propagating up, and then it occupy the affected volume, you know, um, is defined by the length of the well that they've isolated, and that's sure. typically between one and 300 feet. And I, 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 can't, I, I can't do the calculation. What, how many atmospheres of pressure would that gas be under? The, I mean, you're the, obviously the, getting a lot of gas the, because yeah, it's The, the, the pressure impressive. of the gas is not high. The pressures in these formations are what are called hydrostatic pressure. It's basically the pressure okay. due to the column of water from that depth. Well, 7,000 feet of water. Yeah, 7,000 feet of water, which would be, uh, you know, uh, 3,000 PSI. Two, yeah. So. Okay. In fact, the only reason the gas flows is you get the water out of the way, and then the gas is buoyant, so it kind of comes up on its own. Okay, right? thank you. But it's not, it's not under particularly high pressure. Thank you. Uh, my question is, I know that this uh, looks, looks uh, nice and uh, good, but uh, you're talking about 200 years of uh, alleviation of the issue. The question is, 200 years is a microsecond in, in geological terms. Uh, what comes after that? And the second question I have is, uh, I don't know how, I mean, I don't know the calculations, but uh, can you do something? I mean, plants basically convert CO2 into, uh, break the CO2 down. Uh, how many forests do we need in order to, to use that technique? Okay. Um. I said during my talk that we have 200 years of natural gas, but we don't want to use it. We want to stop using it by the middle of this century, okay? We can't u stop using it overnight. You know, can't stop using fossil fuels overnight. Fossil fuels are the problem, but they're also, in the case of natural gas, I think part of the solution. So it would be nice to have a large, uh, you know, a, a largely decarbonized energy system 40 or 50 years from now. Okay, so, and that will sustain us, uh, you know, for hundreds of years or whatever you want to uh, uh, go from there. Okay, um, and forests are, are, are great. I mean, everybody likes trees. Um, and rapidly growing trees remove carbon from the atmosphere, but you can't do it with forests. There's just too much CO2. You know, we're at 400 parts per million. We haven't been there. Um, in tens of millions of years, and the Earth at that time was a very unpleasant place by our current standards. So, um, you know, uh, there's just too much, you know, we, st we just have to stop emitting, okay? It's a source problem. We can't get rid of it, um, you know, just by, um, by planting trees. Um, it's a great, idea. you know, we want to plant trees for all sorts of good reasons, and it does have a beneficial effect, but it just can't operate at scale. Um, to that point, uh, when I was working at EPRI, we hired a uh, forestry expert who um, figured out how much CO2 you could get out of the atmosphere by growing tr trees and uh, using the wood to make paper that you piled up, copies of the New York Times, thousands of feet deep, and uh, you could get about 25% of the CO2 that's being emitted by the U.S. Um, I live in Palo Alto. We have our own Yoko Ono. He's our uh, assemblyman, Gordon, who uh, I read uh, something he wrote a couple of days ago, arguing that fracking is evil. So I think uh, you could give your lecture to uh, that politician maybe convert him. I, th I think they, they recorded this, so send, send, <laughs> send them a link. Um, you know, there's moratoriums being proposed all over the place, and, uh, um, you know, it, it's a political statement. It's, it's not anything more than that. It's not, I, I that. it's not logical. It's not justified. But people want to make a political statement that they want to move away from hydrocarbons, and so establishing these moratoria and you know, um, misrepresenting the, I see, see, that's the problem. If it's just fracking, fracking, fracking. You know, there are problems, and I've tried to, you know, indicate what some of them are, and there are many more. And, you know, but 
you know, as scientists and engineers, our job is to identify the problems and, and seek solutions, not just to, you know, um, make political statements. So, you know, Yoko and politicians will uh, say what they like, but, you know, it may be hopeless, but we, you know, we keep right. trying. One final point. Um, our uh, head of the EPA, uh, in justifying the uh, shutdown of the coal industry or coal-fired power plants, claims that uh, CCS, carbon capture and sequestration, are state-of-the-art. We can do it right now. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> somebody's got to pay for it. And somebody's got to demonstrate that it can be done at scale. It can be done. You know, CCS is, is good. You know, the carbon we do not emit into the atmosphere and we store um, is good. My only issue is whether it can be done fast enough at a large enough scale in an affordable manner and to deal with this, uh, this earthquake problem, right? We've injected a far smaller volume of wastewater and we have these problems all over the country. So, um, you know, one of the solutions is for every, you know, volume of CO2 you inject, you withdraw a volume of the brine that's already there. And that, that will solve the problem, but then you have to figure out what to do with this brine and it doubles the scale of the endeavor, right? For every injection well, you need a production well and uh, et cetera. So, you know, there, there are workarounds, but I, I just think it's, it's impractical at, at the scale necessary.